I'm super happy to see all of you here, uh, especially after last night's party. I hope you guys are feeling right and you have str you're strong enough to, to be here with us. Um, my name is Kasper, but you know that already, and I work at CD Projekt Red. You also know that already. Um, and I do environment art there. Um, and today, I would like to talk with you and share with you uh, my personal and professional um, experience of uh, how, in my opinion, the, use those like pillars to, to create really good environment art. Um, and this talk will, oh, I got this, I forgot about that. <laughs> and uh, this talk will be uh, divided in few parts. Um, the very short one uh, at the beginning will be what I understand uh, is environment art. It's, it's really hard uh, to say it like in one sentence, so probably it's gonna take me more than that, but I will try to explain you what I feel like is environment art. Uh, then uh, I will talk about player experience What's that, in my opinion? Uh, and then I will show you those five pillars that, uh, in, my, um, in my perspective, build really good environments. Uh, and also, I will, I will um, talking about every single one of those pillars, I will give you like a small bricks, building bricks of those pillars, uh, how they can you know, create this whole pillar. At the end, I hope we're gonna have some time for the Q&A. If not, please, you can catch me after this talk, wherever. I would love to talk with you guys. I'm very you know, uh, curious, what do you think about environment art? and what are your um, you know, side of that. So feel free to grab me up after this talk and um, don't hesitate. Um, so the first question would be, what is the environment art? Um, so as I said, probably gonna, it's gonna take me a little bit more than just one sentence. So I will just put some slides from The Witcher, uh, Water, um, Blood and Wine, and we'll try to explain you what I feel like is environment art. Louder, okay, sure. I need to speak louder. Uh, and also sometimes I tend to s tend to uh, speak fast, so if I'm actually gonna wait, go too fast, you can throw something at me and say like, dude, chill out, so I will try to speak uh, slower then. Okay, so going back to the environment art. Uh, the environment art, first, first of all, for me as an artist, is something how we can create like an open, in our case, of course, open worlds for you guys to explore. And we are trying to create those worlds to be as beautiful, as, as, as immersive as possible, because this is actually what is our goal. But on the other hand, we know that we are creating big open world games, and those games have to support um, the game that needs to support, which is story, it's, it's the quest design, uh, the different mechanics, all those different things that, that we'll put together into a game. So. Having aside the, the, the pretty things that we're trying to do here, like pretty buildings and pretty cities, we're actually trying to create the world that, that um, puts all those mechanics from the game in, in like one bag. So basically we're just grabbing all those things and uh, having that base over that, we're trying to build a world for you guys to explore, to be immersed with, and basically I hope be lost with and, and enjoy as much as you can while playing those games. Um, it's super fun. It's super fun, uh, it's, it's a very creative process, but on the other hand, it's an extremely demanding process. But you know, like, as, as hard as it gets, the more satisfaction you get after it's released. And like with The Witcher, you know, we, we knew this game's gonna be good, but we didn't know it's gonna be that good. Uh, because we you know, like, in our head, our like, bar was really high, but it turned out that the, the bar was really high. So, um, in very, like, not maybe, maybe short, but this is how I feel environment art is basically building awards for you guys um, to explore and enjoy our games. And the goal here, again, is immersive because there's nothing more fun uh, to get immersed with a game or a movie, but of course we, we're in our book, but of course tonight we're talking about, uh, about games. Uh, for, to support my talk, um, I would try to explain very shortly what is player experience. And uh, player experience basically is, is what we're trying to, uh, to deliver to the, to the gamers, to the players. Uh, the better the game is, the better the uh, player experience is, right? So our goal is to, to have the best experience out there ever possible. Uh, and there's like a tons of people working on that, in our studio at least. It's like tons of guys. Every single one of those people is artists, but to support my talk, I will 
try to divide those into two groups. One group will be that non-visual artists, and they're working, and in that group, uh, I put the story, the gameplay design, quest design, audio. And the other group, which is purely visual, uh, I got here concept art, level, uh, level design, technical art, environment art, character art, lighting, animation, and cinematics. As you can see, like, environment art is like, just a really small fraction of, of this whole big um, game developers uh, studio part. Uh, so, and we need to talk together, work together, uh, share ideas together. That's why my personal um, first pillar is always teamwork. Uh, and I know I probably someone who saw that so many talks before I, I'm talking about teamwork very often, but because I really believe that without the teamwork, it's really hard to get a good game out. Uh, because you know, like you got like few different teams working on the same project, so it's impossible not to talk to each other. So that's why I believe teamwork is the key to create really great games. And and going back to the story, uh, which uh, the story like the writing team, and uh, how does it? how does this influence our work, which is basically not artist, visual artist uh, work. Um, you know, the story creates always the base for our games, because our games are RPG games, which are very often, not very often, like always heavily uh, story driven. That's why those guys create like a base for every single team to work on that uh, further on. Uh, and that, in, in that uh, influences our environments like 110%. Going back again to the Witcher example, uh, we had the books, right? The books by Mr. Sapkowski. Of course, the games, the story for the game uh, was like different. It was side story that our team uh, at the studio created, but still, the base for the game was taken from the books. Uh, we knew the game would be medieval um, architecture, like uh, wooden small huts, uh, villages, like castles, stuff like that. We knew that we, if we, when we're going to do Witcher, it's not going to be cyberpunk or other different settings. So that gave us like a very rough base of what we're going to do and work on. Uh, and that is how and how strong does this influence our work as environment arts. Gameplay design. Um, gameplay design is, those are, those are the guys that uh, they create mechanics for the game, they figure out how the game can be fun, what the player can do, how can he can do it and stuff like that. And this also influenced our work like a lot, like figure out in gameplay designer would be like, okay, so in this game you can shoot, you can jump, you can run the wall, stuff like that. And we having this information, we need to create the world so the player can actually have fun doing those things. So the environment has to support, um, the environment has to support um, those mechanics, right? And that's also how it influences uh, the environment in such a such a uh, big way. And of course, it also very often describes the needs that we need to support. For me, like a really cool example of that is Mario. Uh, I played this game like a month ago and it's still fun. It's really still fun. Uh, we got the story there because every, everyone knows we need to save the princess. So our goal is to go there, save the princess in a castle and kill the bad guy, which is like a big uh, lizard thingy. Uh, and we got like very simple mechanics here. We can jump, uh, we can run to the right, a little bit to the left. We can destroy those different like mushroom thingies. And that's it. And that's the beauty of it because it's super simple, right? And here we can fight environment art, but environment art is not the key to the beauty of this game. The key to the beauty of the game is still a little bit of the story and how simple the mechanics are. And what I'm trying to say here that either that I am environment artist, environment art is not like the, the key factor of, 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 of the game. It's just like one part of it, right? Uh, so that's why some games, even uh, maybe not as pretty as modern games, are still fun. And we cannot forget about that. And quest design. In our studio, we call the team quest design. Very often those guys are in different studios, they're called mission designers. Basically those are the guys that they have like, um, like a soft story and they're trying to figure out uh, how we can create like a very cool and fun part of the game uh, for, the, for the player, right? So uh, they, like, they can figure out, okay, so uh, we need a castle and we need a lake and between the lake and castle maybe you're gonna need like a cave because the player needs to go there and something fun's gonna happen there. And, and that's why very often those guys give us, again, like ideas and needs for the environment. Also, it's like a back and forth, back and forth talk uh, between us and them uh, with the ideas, but it's a very, very cool iterative process of how we can do a cool environment. And, and again, this also very often, or even like always, describes very hard and uh, very rough uh, needs for the environment to support the mission. And a really cool example that I hope we can see anything there, but if not, this is a Splinter Cell game, the second one, Pandora Tomorrow. Uh, and it's like a co-mission cool there that we actually are exploring moving train from Paris to Nice. 
and I think it's hard to say anything there. I see anything there. Uh, basically, it's like a one room to room exploration. And to go there, do something, it's like a room to room to room searching thing. But um, they figure out like a cool idea. Let's make it actually interesting room. So they figure out probably that, okay, let's do it like a moving train. And this is exactly the same like a moving from one to another room, um, cleaning that room, but still, it's much more interesting, much more uh, memorable for you guys to probably think about, okay, I'm, I was freaking exploring moving train doing so fast. And that's, uh, that's the fun part, because like this small twist to this environment makes all the difference. And all the design, um, when we live, right, there's, there's no, no like a moment in your life you don't have, and you don't hear anything. You're always surrounded by sound, surrounded by the things you can listen to, or even like your ambient sound. Sound and exactly the same works in games. Uh, to fulfill, to complete the environment, we need to have sound there, right? And that sound always finish up, like build the environment. And a really cool example is like Dead Space. And um, the sound here probably builds more environment than the actual environment itself. Because you can see you're in space, you can see like a big uh, half destroyed planet over there. But the sound, the sound that there's, you know, in space, the sound doesn't travel because there's no air there. So you can, the, the sound can, you know, uh, be heard like differently. So in here is an example, the sound actually builds the environment, environment a little bit more than the environment itself. Because with the sound, you can actually feel that you're in space. Because it's just looking at this environment itself, it could be like a very simple room with really cool vista somewhere. And that's why sound is super, super important. Um, so to sum this up, uh, that's why I feel like environment art and um, the teamwork with it is super important. Because I talk about teams right now that are not like visually connected to our teamwork, but still they influence our work like a lot. And uh, with those examples, I hope I, 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 I um, explain it pretty well. That's why talking between the teams and uh, the teamwork, it's super, such, a, such a critical part of, of game developers. Uh, and that brings us to our second filler, which in my case is navigation. Um, I feel like there's nothing worse than um, like fe feeling, uh, playing the game from like, okay, where should I go now? What should I do now? And stuff like that. I know that modern games are like, okay, go there because there's like a huge marker over there and it's flashing with all different colors. But the idea here, like the magic behind it that is like to create the environments, the worlds that you can explore and you exactly know where to go, but you feel like you want to go there. It's not like the game is like grabbing your hands, like go there, dude, like that, that, that gate over there, go with it. It's up to you to go wherever you want to go, but it's up to us to create the environment so you're gonna be feeling like you're on top of this game. You're, you know, um, you're in charge of the things you're doing. Uh, so first of, first of the things that we're doing here is landmarks. And of course, some of those, I mean, most of this, uh, this, this part I'm gonna talk about right now, it's probably more related to level, uh, level design than environment art, but in our studio, we're working very close with level designers, so um, I feel like this is the part of environment work also. And uh, the landmarks, they, they always, uh, always help to, to keep you oriented in the game. There is such a, um, there are like a way of, uh, like a compass, right? So you can figure out where you're at looking at this thing. It can hel help you build this visual map of the location you're at, even without the map on a web, um, without the map on a paper. Uh, very often those landmarks are uh, built as like a goal for the player. So the player seeing that feels like, okay, there's a goal there, and to go there, and uh, that's my goal of this destination. But also very often you just don't go there. It's just like visually landmark for you. And most of the cases they are built like as a big structures uh, seeing almost through the whole game for you. Uh, does anyone ever been to uh, Disneyland somewhere? Awesome. <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> but the thing is that the, the Disneyland is, is really smartly done. Uh, how it's built, how it's laid out. In the middle of the Disneyland, you got this always like big castle, and every street, fin uh, 
you know, at, at the end of every street, you're going to see the castle. So for everyone to be in there, it's like super, super easy to, to orient where he's at or she's at. Because like, okay, the castle's over there, so probably the candies are over there, so let's go there. It's, that's, it's simple, but it's that effective. It's super, you know, it's super helpful to, to, to see this one point all over the place, so you can build your head like a map where you want to go next. And hope, okay, it's nice here. Uh, the Last of Us, uh, I hope you played the game because there might be a, small, a slight spoilers here. Uh, at, in the first part of the game, you're like following this, let's call this like yellow bridge there. And that bridge is actually there just, just for you to know that you're going the right direction. Even if it's like a linear game, it still help you guys to figure out that you're going there and you're getting closer and closer there. You never got there because the story is like differently, uh, you know, uh, outlined there, but, but you got this like mental, uh, mental I, I'm going there, this is my goal, I'm getting closer. And of course, I'm talking about this bridge here. Uh, in The Witcher, which is open world game, so it's a little bit different, but in The Witcher, we did a tons of landmarks throughout the whole landmark. Um, like here, those like villages, um, castles, like even those devil looking uh, small um, stony structures. It's very, it's very you know, original in a way, how it does look, like the forms, that's, and that's how it works for you to figure out where are, where are those things, and you know, seeing those streets where you want to go next. And even like the, the mountain in the back, we got here the one that's a little bit smaller, and in the world, you know, on, on my back, there's like a, uh, the other one bigger, uh, Gorgon Mountain. Do, do you know what this game is? I hope you know. Okay, so just to make sure, on the left we have Doom, on the right we have Wolfenstein 3D. The same developer, more or less, almost the same goal in the game, just like kill everyone, go from point A to point B and the route you're going to take is like, it's up to you. But there's like a one big difference between those two games, and that difference, uh, why we think that Doom is actually grandfather FPS, is not Wolfenstein. Does anyone know what's the big difference here? All right, so the difference, in my, in my understanding, is verticality. The Doom engine can support building different levels, which the Wolfenstein was like just horizontal. And it might, might feel like it's nothing, but actually it's a huge game changer. I can see like the Doom is actually the grandfather of FPS, it's not the Wolfenstein. Uh, first of all, it keeps the player more, more uh, engaged because you don't need to scan just like the horizontal line, you need to scan the vertical line. And it, you, know, like, you need to be looking all over the place much, much more uh, frequently than just like going from left to right or right to left, it's differently. Uh, it helps to make the environments much more interesting because we can go up, down, we have like all those different routes, it's, it's, it's much bigger fun to do it. And it actually gives the player more options, and by having more options the player can feel like more in charge of what she or, or he uh, wants to do or want, where he wants to go. Okay, uh, yeah, so um, just the same example, like the, the line view is horizontal, it's, it's just much easier to scan, like, but with the vertical line, those two lines can give like a much bigger picture of the things you need to look for, like loot, like enemies, doors, wherever. It just it's it's a huge game changer. And I'm I'm kind of like super I just love verticality. So I just trying to put the ver as much verticality as I can, of course to make it sense, but still I just I'm a huge fan of it. Uh, and guiding the player, it's something I told you before, the key here is to create the environment for you to explore, be in charge of it. And, and not feel like the game is, you know, uh, grabbing your hands, like saying, go this, because wherever. It's up to you to go there, but it's up to us to create this, this, this let's call this illusion that, you know, the players actually want to go there, but there are a few things, you know, having your brain saying, like, let's go there. And when it's done right, it removes all the, maybe not all, but most of the frustration from, from anyone that can lost and be like, okay, so what I should do here? Uh, and it, like, figure out if you're walking a park, right? Uh, when you're gonna figure out the park with the path, you're, being, you're probably gonna be like, I'm gonna take the path here because someone do the path, and maybe I will avoid, you know, like doggy stuff on the grass. But on the other hand, when you're gonna have the park with like no paths, and you know you can go anywhere, you're probably gonna be like, okay, I can go anywhere, but where should I actually go? And both examples are totally fine, but the one on the left actually. Probably you're gonna you're gonna spend less time figuring out where you want to go uh, than the one on like just the grass, go straight, go right, go wherever. And the key to that, the, the right example here is that, like in open world games, 
every single corner of this, let's call it level, like this park, has to look just beautiful. And that's also a, a, a very um, you know, hard process to do it like that. And really good examples, like when we would uh, build The Witcher, is like super early, some kind of location somewhere uh, in No Man's Land. When we were just laying down those environments, those paths, uh, we were always using like a, sm like a, like a very bright um, brush strokes to, to create the path to be even more visible. And if I'm gonna use the same, same uh, image here, but just black and white, you're gonna see that's the huge difference just for the paths. I'm talking about those paths, just to make sure. And it, it makes all the difference. Of course, this is open world game, can go wherever you want to go, but when the player is on the road and, and like going really fast through the environments, easier for your team to figure out where where's the path so the road won't get lost anywhere. Good example from, uh, from Uncharted. Um, again, spoilers a little bit if you haven't played the game. Uh, in the back is like a huge landmark, the volcano, um, mountain, wherever. And here we're just using our car to go from environment from point A to B. But those, la those paths are like super different color, it's like super they're almost popping in your eye where you're gonna wanna go. And it's gonna be in a second, it's gonna be here, yes, like, those paths were like not that visible because the, 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 the player was like, okay, where should I go? He, like, like, he you know, took like a second or two to figure out that he can go right or left, and he took left, but still, when the path was not that visible, he was like, okay, and he almost drove into a rock. So that's how important it is to create a really, really visible path for the player to, uh, to go with. And I, I was in Venice like a month ago uh, for a short break. Um, it's a really cool city. I just, if you haven't been there, just go there. It's really nice to go. It's beautiful. But the thing is that you can easily, like super easily get lost there. Uh, and for, in my opinion, like the best way to see the city is to go, go anywhere, get lost, put your GPS on and try to find your way, ba way back home to the hotel. It works. It's perfectly fine. But the tricky part is at night uh, because most of the streets or the paths are like just pure pitch black. It's hard to get anywhere. But there are a few paths that are like little and after like a day or two, uh, I figured out that every single path that's like going from one, let's call it like tourist attraction to another, like those very uh, nice places to go, those paths are lit. So if you're actually gonna just follow those lit paths, you will go somewhere that is like, you know, like civilization there, <laughs> basically. Um, and it works perfectly fine. The same goes with, with games. It's really nice to use lighting as, as, as guidance for, for the player to go somewhere we want to take, uh, wanted the player to go. The other thing is that very often we are trying to create like a walls, but it's going to be like a brick wall, right? It has to be something that will be natural, that you will understand, and that will, that will fit the, the world we're just building here. Like, if you're driving a car, and I, I can understand most of probably uh, dr driving cars, whenever you're going like, to use a car and it's like a detour, you probably won't go through the sign, like freaking... That, I wasn't gonna go there, there, there that way anyway. You're gonna probably follow the path that the detour is, uh, this, uh, is showing you, and that's natural for you, right? And in games, you also can do the same. We can build like environments, like a, like a, let's call this walls, but it doesn't like look like a wall. It just serve the purpose of the wall for anyone to go somewhere. And the last of us, I hope you can see anything. There's like a lamp falling down there. So that's why it's blocking the way, so we want to go there. And at the end of this path, you're like seeing flashing you know, post police cars, like a theater there. So you're like thinking, oh, I want to go there, because this is light, lighting uh, guiding you there. But now it's gone, so it's like, you know you want to go there. Of course, there's a brother saying that you want to go left. And on your left, you're going to see a path with lighting there. The only you know, light working on the path. So, it's really cool because it's interactive. The, those like visual walls, which is like falling lamp, like this uh, theater exploding there. It's all those visual walls for you. So you want to go there, but you cannot. So you're trying to figure out the different way. And it's done perfectly fine here because the player feels like it's like a nat natural progression to him to find the one spot, but can go there, then another, and then another. But again, there was like, like a, the, um, there was like really, really hard lighting work here with the theater and with the path here. Uh, composition works, burn, when done right, it works just magic. Um, it helps to navigate the player, it helps to show those things that should be shown, and then uh, the player try to go there, so those are focal, focal points, focus points. Good example is in Bioshock Infinite, uh, at the beginning of the game, the composition itself just telling you, go straight. The lining also, but the composition st straight uh, itself saying, just go straight. You can probably 
jump over those candles there, but you just don't want to because the composition again is, is, is almost grabbing you by, by, your, by your eyes and saying go straight. And the composition is like a really, really uh, important tool to how we can build environments. Choices. Um, you know, like game, what makes game so special is that you are in charge of what you want to do because you got the choices. It's interactive. So you should be able to say, I want to go left, I want to go right, I'm going to go up, down, wherever. And those choices, first of all, makes the environment much, much more interesting because it's up to us to create those different paths you can take. And every single one of those path, paths has to be super interesting. And it gives freedom to the player, to the gamers, because again, they are in charge of the things they want to go, uh, they want to do and where they want to go. And those, those like little, we call those like challenges, like, like um, problems maybe even solving, makes the player to feel smarter. He's like, okay, I took this route and that guy didn't see me, so I'm super smart because that guy was like, you know, didn't see me. And extremely good example from one of my favorite games is this one here. Snake. Uh, this is one of the best games, in my opinion. And as you can say here, this is a really good example because the game itself, as a as a as a lieutenant here, giving like like it's giving like you a few options. Like you can go to the air duct down there. You can go to air duct uh, in the different spots. You can main gate. You can go like the doors there. It's up to you where you want to go. Some of those paths probably gonna get harder to get to, but will will we'll probably reward you with something different. But on the other hand, again, it's up to you. It's like, as, as, as the game said, it's your course of action. It's up to you which way you feel like is the, the, the best one. And this is all about how to make the choices actually matter and you know, taking the choices, how um, for you guys is important, right? Uh, so to sum this up, um, navigation, which is mostly of the level design part, it's, it's extremely, extremely important to, to make the fun of the game as, at the most. There are many tools, uh, but again, the key here is to create exper um, experience for you guys to be happy about, so you're going to feel on top of the game, you're in charge, but still the game actually drives you, uh, drives you like further. The third, the third pillar is iteration, and it's not like artistic, like how to do the nice stuff, but it's really, really important. And also I talk about it very, very uh, often because I know it might be very frustrating for artists, especially to you know, change the work, tweak the work, even like just start to all over again from the scratch. But it does help and it makes all the difference. That's why we very often um, work, very often, we always work with concept artists very, very closely. Uh, we're uh, you know, um, back in, working back and forth with the ideas and changing the ideas, tweaking the ideas. Because in like 99 cases out of 100, it's like the first idea is never the best one. You can always find something better. You can always tweak something. You can make it better because wherever it's reason. Of course, there's this one, this one time that the idea is going to be such a perfect idea that it's going to stay there, but it's just one time out of the 100. Uh, it's much easier to operate as a concept on paper and tweak things on, on paper. That's why concept art team is always like flooded with work from us, like change this because do it nicely. And we're trying to, here to find the best solution we can for the problem we're working on right now. Like here, uh, when we worked on, uh, again, going back to Blood and Wine, we did uh, different houses for the book layer. And of course, we could do it in 3D and, and tweak it and iterate it, but that would take us probably a lot time longer than, than concept art did. 
So uh, it was really cool uh, to change those small things like the windows, size of the windows, height of the buildings, sizes of the buildings, wherever, on paper, and then build it in 3D. And you know, it's always safer when we do it on paper, but again, even on the paper, we're trying to find the best solution, the best ideas, and the best looking things here. Uh, and also, this works exactly the same for a bigger location. Like here, who played Bell and Wine? Nice, nice, cool, happy about that. So uh, this was the concept art done from for Mandragora, which is like this party on, on, on the cliff mountain. Uh, and that's why uh, also we do iterate in 3D, but during 3D iteration, we also use like very simple geometry to make those things faster uh, and, and, and uh, don't, don't spend time on things that we're not sure about right now yet. And still, this is the same part. We're trying to find the best solution for the problem we are working right now. And question, so for those guys who played Blood and Wine, do you know this part here? I'm sorry? No, uh, close but no. Okay, so uh, this is actually Mandragora, because Mandragora was the location when I did six times. <laughs> Four, five of those times we did it, we block out it, the quest designers did like a draft for the quest, was not good enough, was scratched. So, you know, like it was six times the spot we made from scratch, from, from, from ground up, was, was totally worth it, because it turn, turned out to be like this, and I feel like this is a really good spot, really nice location, and the quest there, it's really interesting. We were like super frustrated about changing things, but at the end we knew that the main goal is just to make something really good, really, really as perfect as possible at the time being. So that's why we just iterate, iterate. It totally paid off. So just to, just to sum this up, uh, guys, I know I know sometimes it's you might feel like it's waste of time, waste waste of the energy, waste of anything. But as long if as long as you, if you're gonna go there like a little better, sometimes it's just worth it to make things better and better. Uh, fourth pillar is visual beauty, because of course, we as environment artists, we're trying to make things as beautiful as possible for you guys to be like, oh my God, this is such a nice, wherever it is, town, wood, wherever. And it's up to us, right? We need to make those things nice. When we go to the internet seeing all those pretty screenshots of the things we did, it's like, wow, this is really nice. And very often those guys taking pretty much better screenshots than we did which is even better. Uh, my question to you guys is, I, I love this picture, it's pretty cool, right? But I would say it's not good enough for concept art for a game. But this one is probably better. And my question is, does any one of you know what's the difference between doing a picture like that, like this super nice pinky violet castle to the one like more production ready concept? Details, moves, all that. But first of all, of course, it's practice, 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 practice. But but you know, like on top of that, I would say it's a visual uh, library. And visual library is like a, like a sentence. Uh, Feng Zhu, like the, the the guy who's doing concept art for movies and games, which is super nice. Uh, go check it out his work. Um, and visual library is when you, by looking at things, and mostly it's like games, movies, and of course real life every single time, every single day up understanding what's cool and what's not cool and how to make things cooler. Uh, even like every single trip, like again, three pictures, like random pictures I took in Venice. And of course, I'm not the best photographer out there, but it's for me just to have like reference for objects, form, shapes, uh, like the textures even on the right, this brick and this plaster turned off. It's really nice and it's really important and, as, as, and like just trying to find references for you as environment artists or just artists. It's really important to be out there and looking for things, how those things might get better, might be, get more beautiful for you. And that, of course, build this visual library and, and probably you won't be able to, I mean, you probably won't start with this castle, you're probably gonna already start with this castle here. This, this is how it is. And of course, for like probably a few years old, the castle on the left is awesome and he will or she will probably progress, but that's why we need to build this library of, of things in our head. So we're gonna have like a level of like, you know, like internal quality level in your head you're going to follow. Uh, and of course, we need to create 3D assets, which is modeling and texturing and that boring style that I don't want to talk about. But it's awesome. I love modeling. I just love modeling. And here we have a few houses from, um, it should move. Okay. From a uh, few houses from Boucler. 
So standard proce procedure, let's say, uh, for the package, modeling that stuff based on concept art and putting that in the game. But of course, that wouldn't look so nice without texture work. And I don't want to sh show you like our texture because it's it's kind of hard. But I will just show you how far we can go with today texture work based on manga scans. And this is the service I love. We're not like partners or anything here, but just, I just personally love the service. Those guys are doing like real, uh, real life scans of, of the environment, which is like rocks, stones, uh, foliage, stuff like that. And this is rendered in, in, in Unreal, in real life. And that I always say that in my opinion, like texture is always above geometry because the texture makes all the difference. Forms, shapes, it's all super important, but on top of that, the geometry, I mean, on top of that, the texture will make all the difference in your work. Uh, and the cherry on top of the cake is the lighting. Um, probably if we could, I mean, don't do it here now, but if we could turn uh, the lights down, it would be super dark, pitch black, and wouldn't probably see anything. Not you guys, not me, like anything. That's because we can see only because of the lighting, right? The light bounces from wall to wall and gives us color, stuff like that. Without the light, we won't see anything. That's why lighting is that important. And uh, doing, like, doing pretty light, it's hard, but it pays off totally. Here you can see, like, it's like my small test uh, when I did back at home with, with, with Unreal. It's like a small render of a few walls and a staircase with just like lighting. But it looks like this. When I just go into unlit mode, which is just geometry and texture, it looks like this. That's how big difference makes lighting, right? Because the shaders work, are working, the, the lights bounce properly, all those things are starting to pop. And this is just pure light, nothing more. That's why lighting is really one of those keys to make the environment be like freaking awesome. Uh, again, GTA 5 here on the left, the same environment with, with just different uh, day setting, like a sundown or, or uh, sunrise, I don't know. On the, on the right, we have this. Um, midday uh, with cloudy, cloudy sky. It's, both are pretty, but probably I w most of you will say like the, the one on the left is much prettier because of the color, right? And, and this is how it is. It's, it's just like the color very often sells what's pretty or not. And the color very often is because of the light. Um, so to sum this up, uh, it's, I think like it's, it's like a straightforward. We just need to do whatever we can do to make things prettier. Uh, of course, uh, right now we have like tools to do that, so those games are getting much, much, much prettier. But also remember that it's super important to make games, if you want to, of course, stylized. And those stylized games are also very, very beautiful. Uh, and that, that strive to getting things better and nicer and nicer looking, it's actually making that's, that's why like every single year those games are probably much, much higher um, art-wise. And the fifth left, left, uh, last pillar is environmental storytelling, for me at least, uh, because I believe that without it, the environment will feel just empty, uh, like, like a shell of, of nothingness. I hope you can see, oh, yes, it's nice here. Uh, probably know what movie is that, if not it's Alien, like the first few minutes of the movies, uh, of the movie, sorry. And this, to uh, like the Prometheus, uh, this was the biggest mystery probably in uh, in the like movie ever. Like everyone was talking about it. What the hell is that? What's going on there? And all of that was done because it was done with the storytelling, environment storytelling. They went there, they saw the big thingy, they figured out that something happened there, they found the eggs there, and your head, you know, like was was trying to put those things together and and create like a story for you. And that story was like you know every single one probably had like a little bit different story, and that's the beauty of it. That's what makes the environment much, much more interesting and memorable for you and for every one of us. Uh, like old games, today there is also, but even old games did like perfectly. Resident Evil, every single room was totally packed with details. So you can go there, explore the spot, figure out uh, how that guy to the, to on the desk looked like that maybe he liked guitar, he had like a cool jacket you know, on the wall, stuff like that. And basically it doesn't add up anything to the gameplay, right? But for the player, with that done correctly, you can totally, totally get lost in this game and you can um, just believe in this world. And very often, those small things, like those, they do tell a story, just with the pictures. So uh, it's super nice to also um, create like a story there. In The Witcher, there's not like a single hut there in The Witcher 3 or, or wherever of the expansions, there is not a single hut there without 
a small bits of pieces of environment storytelling for the player to go there and spend some time figure out maybe what happened there, why this is like that, why this you know like desk is broken or stuff like that. It makes all the difference for you to believe in the world and make the world for you more immersive. Um, there should be a picture here of The Last of Us again because I like, really like this game. Uh, the picture was showing the, um, uh, the highway, the cars, destroyed cars, overgrown cars. Um, small, small things like that, like, like two cars put together and overgrown with, with grass, first of all, can, can tell you how long time I mean, how much time have passed since like the incident or whatever, and what happened there, like you see probably dead bodies. It, it might be depressing, but it sells the story, and it actually grounds the story to the environment and the world we're into, because as you know, the, the world of The Last of Us it was really brutal. Really brutal. Um, and to sum this part up, um, it's, I know it's uh, not maybe like very blown down, uh, because it's up to you, up to artists, how to make the environmental storytelling done right. So let's say like a room packed with things that will actually sell the story. But believe me, it makes all the difference done right because it's much, it's just bigger fun to go to a room and explore this room rather than just to a box and find a key and go out of the box. The simple as that, but it makes all the difference. Uh, so the pillars I talked today are like the teamwork, which again, I feel like is the key to a proper good game developer. Uh, development, um, navigation, iteration, visual beauty, and uh, environmental storytelling. I, I feel like if you can, with your work, you know, like even use some of those things I just talked about here, I'm pretty sure you are going to get better and better, and uh, the environment you're going to create are going to be more immersive and more fun to explore, basically. Um, Okay, uh, I thought it was going to be Q&A right now, but we are hiring, yes. Uh, <laughs> we are hiring, so uh, we're looking for talent uh, for almost every different team. So guys, if you feel like to, you're looking for a job, you want to be a part of a really big project, um, go for it. Uh, it's super nice to work in our studio, super cool, talented teams, and, and it's really nice. So if you feel like it, just brace yourself, go to this website and apply. And we have some time, I believe. Yeah, we've got 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Guys, uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Even if they're in Russian, I can help you with the translation. So our goal is to give you as uh, many knowledge as possible during this conference. So any question that could appear, just raise your hand. OK, I'll go, I'll go for you. Каспер, возможно, у вас есть какой-то свой секрет, как начать делать вот этот скетч, ну, учитывая все то, что вы наговорили сейчас. Окей, uh -huh. okay. do you have any secrets of uh, cre starting creating environment from sketch? What is your secret? Like 2D sketch or 3D sketch, because it's different. Sketch, sketch with all words what you say. How you start to make a sketch? Uh, when we have time, if we have time, uh, we use concept art team. Like we're just saying, okay, we need to have, let's say, castle. Please figure out how the castle might look like. What are the things that we need to, uh, you know, have there? And when the sketch is approved, like very rough, even sketch, just figure out the layout of the castle. We are trying to build that in 3D with again, like very simple geometry. And once the geometry is playable, it's nice and we're happy about it. We just move forward to make it more detailed. But in perfect world scenario, in perfect case, we are using concept art team to uh, support us with, with the things that they can support us with, and then we just jump into it and build it with simple geometry in 3D. Is that fine for answering the question? Yes? Вот на первых картинках, что вы показали в самом начале лекции, там был как живописные линии, живописная композиция, ну такие законные живописи были. Как это все учитывать? Ну, игрок движется, он не может постоянно этот, это постоянно быть на экране. Вот как это учесть? Можно еще по-другому, чтобы я правильно перевела, что... Да, можно это. Да. On the first pictures mm -hmm. about which are, uh, I see the line of composition like a painting. Mm -hmm. 
and how it make in the game for it 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 composition will be visible every time uh, you know, like in open world games, it's hard uh, because you can go to environment from every different direction. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm trying to have every single spot composition-wise done right. Sometimes we have like a path that we're sure the player is going to go through and that we're going to put the composition there because we're sure the player is going to go through that path. But it's impossible to have like every angle done correctly to the, to the composition-wise. We're trying to do our best, but it's not always work and not, sometimes it just won't work. Mm, thank you. Questions. Thank you so much. Uh, hi. Hi there. Uh, how many time takes to create, uh, for example, one location? How many time takes? Uh, it, it, it just depends how big it is. Sorry? Uh, it depends how big the location is. Uh, like, for example, like going back to Mandragora, right? The, 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 like those, the, the party on, on, on the cliff mountains. Mm -hmm. And I want to show today uh, earlier. Um, like the draft and block out took me, having the concept art took me like one day. And finishing up, like, okay, building the meshes and, and all the decoration pieces, it probably could take like a week, but very often uh, we're working with uh, still and, and, and quest designers, and those, those guys are thinking what also can be changed. Uh, but like, I would say, like, from without any problems, the Mandragora took like, 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 like a week, maybe less than two weeks. Is it enough for, for the answer? Yes, thank you. She says thank you to you. <laughs> thank you so much. I, I have a question. Sure. Uh, you mentioned navigation in games and these uh, giant map makers like question marks on map where to go. So I have a question. Is it possible to build a level for RPG game with hard quests without this maker so a player could orientate in the level without them? Is it possible? Is Would it be easy I mean, to play? Yeah, I got it. Um, it's possible. I don't know if it's going to work. <laughs> uh, I mean, yes, again, it's possible, I feel like, but um, open world RPGs is a little bit different than linear games. And I feel like those things, like those markers done right, they just they, they are helping you. If they're not done right, uh, done right, sometimes they're just like too much of those things on the screen and you just don't know what, where to go or what to do. Uh, but like if they're like just small hints somewhere, it's helping you because like the open world games are really big today. And it's just way too much, you know, coverage to go anywhere. So, you know, you need to find the balance between how to use those and 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 how not to use those. It's 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 it's, it's how you should test it as long as it's actually going to work. But it's doable, of course, it's doable. Okay, thanks. And for non-open world RPGs, is it easier? Uh, yes, it is easier because when you are creating like a path, like a linear path, you exactly know where the player is going to be and where he wants to go. So, using all those different things that I talked today. I feel like it's possible without any markers to, to build a good environment to go from point A to point B. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hey, Hi. Um, thank you for this knowledge you shared with us. Thank you. So um, I just want to ask uh, you, you came here in this t-shirt. Yeah. And uh, can you tell us anything that Maybe it will be new for us about this project? No. Thanks for asking. Okay, thank you. No, sorry guys, I seriously cannot talk about it at all. But of course, worth a try. I'm sorry, uh, I want to ask, um, can we apply these pillars to a uh, 2D game, platformer or uh, RPG like game totally totally um, most of those things were translated to 2d exactly the same uh, probably gonna do a little bit different things but I feel like like the composition like even the navigation part will work totally fine with you environmental story environmental storytelling part the same so go for it it should help you thanks спасибо за прекрасную лекцию и у меня вопрос Насколько вы взаимодействовали с концептами и насколько вы могли как 3D артисты от них отходить? Thank you for your speech. Um, how tight is your cooperation with concept artists and um, how you as environment artists can influence on the concept and the final uh, visual art, visual look? So uh, to illustrate this, uh, we're talking and fighting every single day, every day. 
Uh, but it's fun because you know, like they have tons of cool ideas. We have different ideas. We're trying to talk about that and, and figure out what's going to work, what's will, what will work the best for the game and art-wise. So every single day, I, I, I'm serious right now. Every single day, we're just like fighting about that, what to do, uh, how far to go. Marta's over there. He can tell you how it is uh, because she's a concept artist over there. <laughs> but but it pays off. It's how it should work. You should talk. You should you know um, going back and forth with these ideas and and figure out what's best for you. But we're doing this all the time, every day. Is it good? Uh, hello, Kasper. Uh, thank, uh, thank you for all the information you shared today. Uh, my question is, um, uh, how would you, as an uh, environment artist, approach uh, the creation of the spots on the environment uh, that you can, as a player, interact with? Uh, for example, um, in games like, uh, sorry, I'm not using uh, City Project React as uh, games as an example, um, Tomb Raider or uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, uh, there are spots uh, on the environment that are uh, lighted as a different color, right? And it, it and it indicates that you can interact with them. And uh, how would you approach it? Um, do you do it um, before uh, on paper or you sketch it? Or uh, do you make a 3D model and uh, is it easier uh, that way? Because it's uh, like a, it's a pretty large scale, right? And uh, I'm curious, uh, what's the best way to do it? Well, you know, like there's, there, are, there are tons of things that will make the, the process different. Uh, in perfect world, in perfect case scenario, uh, we're gonna have like uh, like a story from level designers and quest designers how to the pro the mission will progress there, right? And someone will take this part of the land, and knowing that he will just block it out with simple geometry or whatever it is, and and move further. But very often those things will change, will move and and, and change positions. So um, on a blockout stage. We, we, we use like different colors, yes, but in the final game, it depends what will work. Sometimes it might be different colors, sometimes it might be light, some other composition. All those tools that you know, I also talked about today, but as long as they're going to fit this path we're working on. So it's, it's hard to give like a rule, uh, you know, rule of thumb here. It's, it's more of the process of how you feel about it, what's going to work the best. I hope I actually sure. answered the question. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Test, test. <laughs> Hi there, Karsper. Hi there. I have a question. Uh, when I played uh, The Witcher 3, uh, there were like a ton of uh, wonderful photo references, ton of things that are that uh, tells a story about The Witcher and the world of uh, Witcher, world of people living there. Like, uh, I don't know, like ancient runes, dragons and a lot of stuff to I don't know, like uh, house uh, stuff, like uh, beds, like uh, I don't know, everything, just everything. How do you find the f uh, right for the references? The, do you uh, search for that in your team, or you are just trying a lot of uh, different things that will work the best way? Thank you. Both things. Uh, sometimes we have like the days that the whole team is looking for references and trying to find the references that will be best for us. Uh, sometimes we're just trying to experiment what's the best for our, you know, for the, 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 the things we're working on right now. Very often the things that we like even experience in our lives are just like a pure reference. So, you know, as long as it's going to be like a picture, movie, book, whatever, and they're going to help you out with it, it's just worth to try and even try it out and see if it works. So, th this as much as I can say. I hope it's answered the question fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Guys, do we have more questions? Okay. Great speech. Thanks a lot. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, the question is uh, somehow related to Jude's question about okay. your T-shirt. Oh, okay. uh, uh, I'd, I'd like I'd like to this. know. Um, you provided us with uh, great examples from the Witcher game, uh, but I'd like to. I wonder if you'd like to uh, share us, uh, with us the most distinctive thing uh, which differs cyberpunk. Uh, environmental design from, for example, The Witcher. I would love to, but I really cannot. I see. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. OK, more questions related to the speech? 
Hello, thank you for your speech. Uh, I have a question. How do you approach the amount of visual information in the location in order not to overwhelm the player with this inf visual information? That's a really good question, really good. And I feel like it's, it's there are two things. First of all, it's always experience and how far you want to go. But uh, I also use the rule, it's like less is more. And very often, less on the screen actually is more for the player to explore. So. Um, the second you're going to feel like it's too much there, it's probably too much there. And you need to like a step, step back, take a step back and figure out where you can take out and, and maybe change. So uh, sometimes I know, even like working on The Witcher, I put sometimes too much stuff on the screen and now I know it. When I play the game, I see it. That's why less is more and try to put as less things as possible, but still enough to support wherever you want to go. And again, it's hard to give like it's going to be 10, 20 percent of the screen covered with things. It's just up to you to figure out um, how does it work for this particular spot you're working on right now. And I hope it answers the question again. Thank you. And uh, the last question for today. Uh, hi, I want to ask uh, when you are creating the open world game, uh, what part have to be done? At first, the um, what helped? Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm, thank you. Uh, nice question. First of all, always again in a perfect world uh, and perfect case scenario, it's level designers are taking like a, this whole land, like an island, wherever it is, and they figure out the spots. Uh, like they're gonna be a big spot. Like let's say Novigrad was one of those big spots, like the biggest mountains there. And uh, very often. Uh, they figure out the spots of how long you want to travel from one spot to another so the player won't get bored from you know, traveling. And having like a, this small map of things, like those big interesting things, we can go to a smaller things. And basically level designers are like making like a points on a map where something should be there. And we're having that, we're trying to make those things as interesting as possible. But it's always like planning, even sometimes on 2D on paper, then in 3D building like the small uh, map of things where some, something should be, and then going further and further to, to build the world with actual art. Is it enough for you as an answer?